Good morning, guys. I'd like to welcome you here in uh, Studio One on the second day of Hackers Congress Parallel Policy in Prague. Uh, before we start today, you may see this uh, wonderful picture that my colleague chose to welcome you in here. Uh, this is a uh, Czech Prime, Prime Minister. Uh, he was on uh, that time just taking care of uh, finance of our state. And we tried to learn him how to handle Bitcoin. You know, it wasn't much successful, <laughs> as you can see on that picture. And um, I think that was uh, one year after this, uh, this moment that he said into media that he don't know what Bitcoin exactly is and don't think that anybody use it. So we weren't successful at all, but <laughs> I hope you will learn much more here on the Congress. Uh, but now, I would like to introduce the first speaker of the second day and this speech will be uh, more useful for crypto companies or if you are thinking about accepting crypto so uh, the speaker will tell you something more about uh, how to do it uh, regularly if I say it right and I think he will introduce uh, more himself but please uh, welcome Pablo Coirolo in here. Hello. Well, first of all, I want to thank the organizers. Uh, this is the second year that I'm here, and it's really an honor to be able to present here in Paradenis Polis. I can never pronounce that correctly. Um, I'm originally from Uruguay, South America. There you see the Crypto Bay Montevideo coming from there. Um, but some four years ago, I got into Bitcoin in Berlin. Uh, with somebody who introduced me to it, which is here from Prague, Elena Vernova, you probably know her. Uh, she was the ex-CEO uh, of Trezor. And uh, meeting her in Berlin, I decided that definitely this is something that I wanted to do full time. Uh, a little bit from my background, I was CEO of Telefonica, the Spanish telco company in Uruguay and I launched the first LMDS network there. And then I went from M&A to working to Nestle to five years. But my origins come from the beginning of the internet in 1992 in Washington, DC. So when I discovered Bitcoin and I discovered the, this new technology, I definitely knew that this was what I wanted to do because this was the next wave. Um, I participated in an ICO project, and one of the things that I uh, was in, part of the ICO project was defining the jurisdiction. And uh, let's say, how many of you have projects that are looking for jurisdictions? Okay, good, good. I hope that today you will, have, you will be much closer to understanding what are the jurisdictions which are crypto-friendly, and which are the ones that are going to be crypto friendly in the future. Because I think that when you start a company, you start a project, this is probably the most difficult question to answer. Where do I start my company? Where do I establish myself? Uh, so the objectives of today, we have three objectives. First, to define and explain what a crypto-friendly jurisdiction is. Second, to understand the challenges of these crypto-friendly jurisdictions. And finally, I'd like to talk about creating a crypto-friendly jurisdiction through new power. And that's what we've done with Crypto Bay Montevideo. So let's just start with something that confuses many people is is Bitcoin legal? Is Bitcoin not legal? Uh, what, what jurisdictions are friendly, which are not friendly? And in terms of the world, if you see, um, there's some countries that have created an absolute ban on Bitcoin. Okay? And the reason why they've done it is they vary. Some of them, like Ecuador, because they launched their own cryptocurrency which after a couple of years, they figured out that it didn't work out very well for them. Uh, Bolivia also, because all of the issues that they had, they decided to ban uh, Bitcoin. Others have to do with uh, religious 
uh, connotations, that they don't understand how to how this works with their religious cognitations. And there's other countries that have implicit bans. What are implicit bans? An implicit ban means that it's not prohibited, but there are such regulations in the, com in, in the country that make it practically not viable to be able to, to work with there. And then there's countries who have changed courses. Uh, this map is from how much net and at the time, Russia, it was illegal to be able to, uh, uh, to trade in Bitcoin. And Russia recently has changed course about that. So what we have here is there's a lot of uncertainty in the world in terms of what you're going to do and which jurisdiction to be in. Now, where are we today in terms of all all of our world, all of our cryptocurrencies, everything, what does it mean in the world? So I decided to put up this one, which really makes, it gives you the idea of how relative we are with respect to the total money supply. We are one step above Jeff Bezos and one step below Amazon. So when we analyze the crypto-friendly uh, jurisdictions, and we, we analyze the impact that cryptocurrencies have in the world, let's keep this in mind. And something that you're going to see in the next graph is this graph is from September 17th, 2018. This graph is from February, and you'll see that the market cap here is $470 billion. So we went from $470 billion to 200 billion in a couple of months. This also explains the great variation that we have in terms of the cryptocurrency market. And the reason for this is not because this is, does not work. This is because this is new. Everybody in this room, even though now, you know, when we started, I started four years ago, uh, it, it, it used to be, you know, that we were the pioneers. You are still the pioneers in this. So this is, imagine that you're in 1998 in terms of the internet. And that's why you have so much variation in terms of market valuation. And we're trying to find the way to be able to develop this technology and get there. Whoever tells you that they know where this is going, it's the first sign of alert. Because in 1998, when we were in the beginning of the internet, and I started in 96, my first company, we had no clue. We have some, some idea that we are going to change the financial system. Because the financial system is changing. And this is why this one is important. Why are we getting so much pushback from the financial system? Why is the financial system really, uh, you know, closing bank accounts of any company that has the name crypto or Bitcoin? Well, if you have Bitcoin, forget it. There's no way that nobody will open uh, a bank account for you. Um, and that's because even though we are a little bit bigger the, than Bezos, we're starting to come to the size with the big players. So this is the market cap of JP Morgan, and this was our market cap in February. Now we're half of that, but we're still very close to JP Morgan. Bank of China, 188 billion. Bitcoin alone is 166 billion. Goldman Sachs, 100 billion. And the total of all the other Bitcoin Cash, Ripple, and everything, 170 billion. Morgan Stanley, 99. Ethereum, 90. So the banks are starting to realize that, hey, this is something that we definitely have to get on board. And you see the banks having huge departments of sometimes 80, 100, 150 people just dedicated to figuring out how this works 
and how they can be implemented and how they can be not overrun by this new technology. The other thing that's happening is that access to cap in capital for innovation is changing drastically. And this is the issue of ICOs. Last year, in the same place with Tone, we debated if ICOs were good or not good, if they were a scam or they weren't a scam. And the truth is that ICOs, yes, there are many scams out there, but they are also the way that an entrepreneur can fulfill their vision and their dream without the interference of third parties. The question is, how do we regulate or how do we establish the rules to let the scammers out? So the scammers are out there in the open and grandma, even though grandma doesn't invest in ICOs, does not fall for these scams. Now, many, you know, all of you are probably going to have a conversation with a friend, with somebody, and they're going to come to you and they're going to say, you know what? Uh, Bitcoin is used for money laundering. Bitcoin is used for child pornography. Bitcoin is using all the energy of the world. So I looked and I looked until I found this research paper, and actually the source is under that, but I, I can share the source with you, but it's a report, it's like an 80-page report that takes information from every, public information in terms of, for example, one of the big things is crypto mining is going to use up all electricity, and it's going to ruin the environment. Well, I got news for you. Gold mining uses a lot more energy than all of Bitcoin mining, plus the production of CO2 is incredibly bigger than what Bitcoin is. The other thing is crypto is being used for money laundering. Really, money laundering is still being done by the US dollar and the financial system, and they're doing it very well. So, no. Bitcoin is not being used for money laundering. Crypto is being used for scams. Well, institutional fraud is 3.8 trillion a year in fiat currency. And yes, we've had our Mt. Gox, we've had our, our issues, and we are at half a billion. So what I like to do is always when somebody tells me that this is a scam, is respond with facts. Because when you respond with facts, then they have nowhere to go. And, you know, always when I give a presentation, just the financial system just gives me a gift right before the presentation. Either the Panama Papers or it, it's, it, it's the, you know, it keeps on giving and giving. So, this guy is named Thomas. Okay, Thomas was the CEO of the Dansk Bank, a very reputable bank that between 2007 and 2015 laundered $234 billion. This is like saying a hundred story building passed through the center of Prague and nobody saw it. Okay. So, and, and this is what I really like. It's clear that Dan's Bank has failed to live up to its responsibility in the case of possible money laundering in Estonia. I deeply regret it. And that's it. How many people, let, let's just take a vote. $234 billion were laundered. How many people do you think are going to go to jail? Exactly. Now, Listen, you use uh, Bitcoin for something illicit and you go in for life because, you know, we, we can't, you know, we can't have money laundering on Bitcoin. And this is, you know, this is why it's, it keeps on giving and giving and it's on the day Dance Bank scandal aired, the market cap for all cryptocurrencies 
And I remember today, it, it was 1,977 cryptocurrencies was $190 billion. So here are the sources because the first thing that they're going to say, nah, this is not true. Well, here are the sources of this that happens. So basically, with all this that I'm telling you is there is going to be a big pushback for us to develop crypto-friendly jurisdictions because the financial system is starting to feel really threatened. Really threatened because it's not complying what it's supposed to be doing and it's technologically not providing the solutions to the world that it should be providing. So the combination of these two things are having that we are being attacked by all types of articles saying all that information that I told you, which is false. I, I, I read uh, the other day, Bitcoin is going to use all the energy in the world, you know. So th what the best way to counter all of these things is being informed. And once you have informed and when you have the information, then you can sit down at the table with the president of any bank or any financial system. And when they sit down and say, well, you can't open your bank account here because we're scared of money laundering, show them a picture of Thomas. You know, say, you're worried about me? Really? You're worried about me? You should be worried about Thomas. Thomas is the guy you should really worry about. And it passed by through J.P. Morgan and Bank of America. And to make full disclosure, J.P. Morgan did cancel their relationship with uh, Dank's Bank in 2013. Now, it took them from 2007 to 2013 to realize that there was money laundering going through here. And there were many, many tattoos. So basically, what I want to say is it's going to be a difficult road. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. This is a proposed definition to what a crypto-friendly jurisdiction is. A crypto-friendly jurisdiction is a jurisdiction who embraces blockchain and crypto ecosystems and promotes the development of an environment where companies in the space can develop and expand their different business models. And this is very important because the thing is, you have to really embrace this new technology and you have to be willing to work with the companies to develop sound business models. And we have come up with some of what are the building blocks. First of all, you have to have a bi vibrant ecosystem. You have to have people like you who are willing to engage in this new technology and are willing to develop new and innovative solutions for the world. Be it in N number of places and N number of things. You need to have, I, 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 I confess to you, I've changed this like four times before the presentation. I had put smart government intervention. I had uh, put a whole bunch of things. And at the end, the word that comes out the best is positive government support. Because not all government support is good. When you have positive government support, it's a government that really understands and is willing to take the risk to go out there and be exposed. Because all of this information that I was telling you out there coming against what this new technology is going to do is by all of them who are being threatened by it. Also, aligned financial system. The financial system is not aligned with this. They are fighting it all ways that they can. So what we're trying to figure out now is how slowly parts of the financial system is starting to align with this new technology. Also, a proactive regulator. A regulator that's not scared to experiment. It's not scared to try out new things because they are convinced that this is the new wave. 
And finally, legal certainty. Because most of the jurisdictions of today, and I'm sure most of you who raised their hand, you go, you sit down with a lawyer, and they say the famous words, well, it depends. So this is what all of the new companies are really looking for, to have legal certainty of what we do. So what do we have now? Lack of clarity. That, that's what, what exists in all of the different jurisdictions. What I'd like to do now is bring a little bit of clarity into the different jurisdictions. So these are some, this is by no means everyone. These are the ones that I have picked out as jurisdictions that aspire to be crypto friendly. Okay? So we have Barbados. In last year, I was with the Prime Minister of Barbados, and they are wanting to really become a crypto friendly country. They have, uh, um, uh, they have a, an insurance industry, uh, and they're trying to, to, to expand into crypto. Belarus, Estonia, Jersey, Gibraltar, Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, Malta, Singapore, and Switzerland. So these are all jurisdictions that are all aspiring to become crypto-friendly, but they're working at different speeds and have achieved different things. So we come up with this graph here. And this graph, what it tries to do is take the five elements that we have talked about what it takes really to be crypto friendly. And we started classifying each one of the countries. The first thing that all of these jurisdictions have is, yes, the government decided that they want this to happen. Not quite sure in everyone how, but they want to become crypto friendly jurisdictions. In terms of ecosystems, some of these jurisdictions already have vibrant ecosystems. In Estonia, there's a big development in terms of healthcare records. And they're, they're, the government has established to be able to start with healthcare records there. In Gibraltar, also, there's a vibrant community that is, there's already different exchanges, different companies that are set up there. We have Liechtenstein, and a disclaimer, I have my company in Liechtenstein. Uh, so I have my company's Light 47, and that's, we've selected Liechtenstein as the jurisdiction. So I want to make a disclaimer because you'll see everything is green there, so it's, then we'll have the, the limitations of each one. Luxembourg, uh, Malta also has if you start seeing in the ecosystems, you see that the Gibraltar, Liechtenstein, Malta, Singapore, and Switzerland are the ones that really have vibrant ecosystems. Switzerland with Crypto Valley. Oh, uh, everybody knows Crypto Valley Souk? No? Yeah? Good. There, there is a... We have there a, a Luca from, from Switzerland. Um, proactive regulator. I can't explain the importance of having a proactive regulator. A regulator that's willing to try new things. Um, in Switzerland, it, it, it's, the FEMA has really been one of the regulators that has given the space for the community to grow. The same has happened in Liechtenstein with the FMA. The, by establishing uh, a sandbox approach. They call it the regulatory lab, where companies can come and say, this is my project, this is my idea, this is what I'm going to do, and they say, you know what, this, this is okay. You can get a legal opinion. Uh, and any of, any of you from the states? States? Okay. Have you tried to get a legal opinion in the United States? Okay, that, that, that. I'm not going to say any comments about that. 
So <laughs> half my family is American, so. Um, but there's countries that you just can't get a legal opinion. You try to get a legal opinion, and it's impossible. But they'll charge you $100,000 to sit down and talk to you about it, but they will not put it down on paper. Now, in jurisdictions like Switzerland, Liechtenstein, and Gibraltar, you can get a legal opinion about if your project fulfills the requirements that are needed to do this legally in the country or not. And I think that's one of the most important things because the, the worst thing that you can have when you start a company is un legal uncertainty. Am I going to have the regulator on my back right after I launch? So this is, this is one of the criteria that we think is very, very important. And finally, last but not least, is a line financial system. And this is the very important, can I get a bank account? Because we are all crypto, con uh, crypto uh, companies, and we can deal with, com but at the end of the day, you're gonna have to pay a salary. You're going to have to use fiat. And when you need to use fiat, you need a launching pad where to be able to do it. Today, it's the banks. In the very near future, you will have other options that are quasi-banks. But this is very important because most of these jurisdictions, even though they give you legal certainty, it's very difficult to get a bank account. One of the advantages that we have in Liechtenstein is we have Bank Frick which is a bank which is really turned into a crypto bank. Uh, uh, bank Frick was a private bank that decided to fully embrace the crypto and block blockchain ecosystems. And if you go there with a project, you can actually get a bank account, not only in fiat, but also in crypto, which is something very rare. There are other places which are starting to move. That's why I put here Gibraltar, Malta, and Switzerland in yellow, because thanks to the effort of the, um, the ecosystem, banks are starting to look to open bank accounts for crypto companies. They're doing it with a very, very strict criteria. That's why I put them in yellow, because yes, you can open a bank account, but one of the banks in Switzerland who declared their, that they're opening bank accounts has opened two bank accounts so far for crypto companies after doing a very, very long process. Now that's gonna get better. There are going to be other banks that are getting in. Slowly, they're starting to see that they either get on board or there's going to be other solutions that are going to substitute what they do. So this is getting better. And I am sure by next year, we're going to have green, uh, green uh, check marks in most of the jurisdictions. So this is, this is not um, you know, a plus or minus. What this is is evolution and how each of the jurisdictions is evolving to embrace the crypto and blockchain seed. So a little bit about the four jurisdictions which had uh, green and yellow arrows all the way to the bottom. We have Liechtenstein, Switzerland, Malta and Gibraltar. And when I talk about public support, this is what I call public support. Malta's prime minister, got in front of the United Nations and said, we have launched ourselves in the blockchain island and being the first jurisdiction worldwide to regulate this new technology that privately existed in a vacuum. That's positive government support. I mean, if you're gonna do it and do it in front of the United Nations, okay, you're definitely in on our ecosystem. This is the Prime Minister of Liechtenstein, Adrian Hasler, also announcing the Blockchain Act. So you start seeing this tendency to really, really positive 
approaches to blockchain and, and crypto. In terms of legal certainty, each of the jurisdictions has taken a different approach. For example, Gibraltar. Gibraltar decided that it is not going to bring a full regulation. What it has is they have nine principles. So they have a principle approach. They have nine principles, and if you're going to do a blockchain, um, a blockchain or crypto project, you must explain to them how you are going to fulfill those nine principles. So that's a, an, an interesting uh, approach because they say, this is what you need to do. You show me how you do it. And you need to have approval. In Liechtenstein, we've taken another approach. The approach that we've taken is the world is going towards a token economy. So this token economy represents everything that we do, all interactions. It's not limited to a cryptocurrency. It's not limited to a certain blockchain. It's really everything that we're going to do, all the interactions that we do today are going to be tokenized. And that's how we are going to approach it. So it's a functional approach to legislation. And the Blockchain Act contemplates the whole concept of the token economy. So it's, it's I think, a very forward-thinking type of legislation because it's thinking of all of the, the interaction in between all the actors. Malta's approach is they've decided to come up with three bills that regulate mainly ICOs and exchanges. They, they're really, they want to become a center where exchanges come and put their base. Binance has been there. Binance also has come to Liechtenstein. So what they've done is they have three. One is just the Virtual Financial Assets Act. And this basically regulates how ICOs are done. Then they have the Malta Digital Innovation Authority Act. Is they, they create an authority that does the regulation for everything in the world of crypto and blockchain. And finally, the Innovative Technology Arrangements and Services Act, which is basically this relates mainly towards exchanges and how exchanges work. And in Switzerland, FINRA has issued ICO guidelines. Basically, what they've done is, if you do an ICO, you need to, support, um, you need to uh, present uh, an ICO proposal and wait for a no-action letter. And they've done a classification of tokens. So they classify the tokens into payment tokens, or cryptocurrencies, utility tokens, and asset tokens. And what they've said is, if you have an asset token, then basically you have to follow the securities laws. And if you are a utility token, you don't have to follow exactly the securities law. They also have something called hybrid tokens. A token can be a utility and a payment token. And it can be a security and a payment token. So it's, it's as you see, each jurisdiction has adopted a different approach None of them are better than other. I think that each one really depends on their environment. And when you're looking to what jurisdiction you're going to go to, I think it really depends on what your business model is and what, you're, what, what, what type of business that you're doing. So I'm just going to very briefly tell you about the blockchain. Liechtenstein, how are we in time? I have five minutes? Oh, good. Well, very quickly. Blockchain law in Liechtenstein, it has legal definitions of the essential elements of the token economy, so it defines all the elements of the token economy. The token is the basic element of the token economics. And just to give you an idea, this is the same concept than when world trade was transformed when the container was introduced. Basically, the container serves to put any type of products into it and ship it around the world. That's the same concept in terms of the token. 
The token itself is the shipping container. What's inside the token is really what gives it the value and the differentiation. Also creating legal certainty when buying tokens, bankruptcy regulations, definition of minimum standards for central service providers, minimum standards for a token emission, and procedure and rules for government supervision. That's a very brief, and I'm sorry that I'm uh, going around. What are the main challenges of all of these jurisdictions? Remember, the, these four jurisdictions are all European. One is the regulatory framework is that it's so diverse that at one point there's going to be the European Union wanting to unify all of these different concepts. The second is the alignment of the, of the financial system. It's very, very difficult to get all the banks on board. But now, recently, Switzerland, the Crypto, Crypto, Bay, uh, Crypto, Bay, Crypto Valley Association and the Association of Banks of Switzerland have come together to create guidelines so banks can open bank accounts for blockchain and crypto-based companies. And the most difficult one is immigration from non-EU countries. And this is the little secret that when, if you are not from an EU country and you try to get residency in any of these jurisdictions, unless you have a sufficient amount of millions of dollars or pay $300,000 in taxes, you're not going to be able to get your residence. So that is an issue. And that's why we launched Crypto Bay Montevideo. Because what is Crypto Bay Montevideo? I know I have five minutes. I, ha I have here, she's controlling me there. What we started looking is, okay, immigration is an issue. So how could we unite two jurisdictions to be able to co-develop this new ecosystem? And I started looking in Liechtenstein about always, my, my father always says, before you propose something new to somebody, study their history, okay? So I went back to start looking and I found that Uruguay had a double taxation agreement with Liechtenstein. And Liechtenstein's largest financial institution had been in Uruguay for the past 10 years with its Latin American operations center. So, as I said, I'm originally from Uruguay. My mother's Italian, my father's Uruguayan. So I decided to look at Uruguay that I knew had uh, a very important software development community. Just to give you an idea, Uruguay, we're this little country right here uh, in South America. I know it's fairly small here. We're roughly twice the size of the Czech Republic. We're 176,000 square kilometers, 3 million, uh, and 21,000 GDP. It's, in Latin America, considered the Switzerland of Latin America. We're number one in transparency, democracy, equity, blah, 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 all the, all the different things. But the most important thing is we also have one of the largest digital infrastructure in Latin America. 50% of every household in Uruguay has fiber optic coming to it. And we have the highest download speeds of all of Latin America. Um, and we have one thing that was very, very interesting to me, is that we are the first country in the world to provide every school child from first grade to 12th grade a computer. And all of the curriculum is developed on the computer. And here you have, it's the famous One Computer, One Child program. We have 300,000 children in schools that are uh, having, um, basically becoming digital citizens. They, they do all their science, their math, everything on the computer. There's even a TV channel where this is developed. And this means that every year, we have 50,000 students who will graduate potential programmers. So put all this together and decided to create the bridge between Uruguay and Latin America. But how do you do it? 
So I was invited to speak at two conferences in Uruguay. And after speaking at both conferences, I definitely found out that this was, you see her behind me, right? Yeah. <laughs> I feel her presence there. Um, we'll be five, five more minutes than we have. So basically what I decided was that, yes, the moment was right to launch Crypto Bay Montevideo. And I launched it like this. This was Crypto Bay Montevideo, just an idea. And the concept that I used was I was invited to a talk by Henry Timms. How many of you have heard of New Power? New Power? Okay, that just give you a really brief. What New Power is, in the Oscars of last year, there were two people that were thanked in equal amount of times by all the artists. One was Harvey Weinstein, and the other one was God. Seven months later, a group of women, seven women, were able to bring down the equivalent of God throughout the United States. And this started, you know, I started thinking, how can I use this new power to develop the crypto-friendly ecosystem in Uruguay. And what came to me? Let's use the concepts that we use and that we believe in. We believe in the structure of nodes, the resilience of nodes. So what we did was, I did the first meetup of Crypto Bay Montevideo, and I created this T-shirt. And I decided to go out and start recruiting people to be part of Crypto Bay Montevideo. And what are we? We are promoters of blockchain crypto ecosystem in Uruguay. We believe in three principles. Decentralization, radical transparency, and inclusion. We are not an organization. We are not, uh, we don't have a legal background. We are just a group of people that want to create Uruguay into a crypto-friendly jurisdiction. And we are a community of doers. We organize in coordinating nodes and act as catalysts in their communities and impose the creation of awareness and education on blockchain and crypto technology technologies. We believe that together we can transform Uruguay into a crypto-friendly country. So what have we achieved in one month, this has been done in one month. We've, we've set up coordinated nodes. Each one of these nodes is a reference in their area. Because if we're going to make this into really mainstream, what we need to do is, yes, of course, we need to have programmers. But we also need to have agriculture engineers that start to explain to other agriculture engineers how this is used and how this technology is used to be able to trace meat from the calf to the butcher. We also need business people. Ignacio Dell is the CEO of the World Trade Center, a duty-free zone that has 10,000 people working on them. Martin Dovat, international platform known, is the CEO of Son America. Enrique Topolewski, the academic node, is the head of innovation of one of the largest universities in Uruguay. So I got all of this team together, and each one are acting as independent nodes. We also got ambassadors, and we got some interesting ambassadors. Gabriel Kurman, co-founder of Rootstock. Magdalena Ramada from Willis Towers. This is my brother, who's in New York. Um, Marco Benitez, who's from Crypto World Sug, all of them Uruguayans. What's happened? We've created, and in the reality, there's 12 because there's 10 that are thematic, you know, academics, interior, blockchain, communications, legal, energy, social responsibility, agriculture, business, and diversity and entrepreneurship. All of these were created in one month, and each one is having active discussions of how to use blockchain and these new technologies in their areas. And the interesting thing is, who's getting into this? The people who are getting into this are people from the government. 
the people from businesses, the people from banks, because you're not l discussing what blockchain is. They're discussing how do you apply blockchain in each one of the individual areas. And what another phenomenon that's happened is we've suddenly had gone from f five meetups about blockchain in the last two years to one meetup each way, each month, arranged by each one of the nodes. So we've had, this is the first node energy, was on the 4th of October, on the 11th, the legal node, on the 19th, Crypto Bay. And what do they discuss? They discuss, for example, in the legal node, how to accept Bitcoin in Uruguay. So companies that want to accept Bitcoin sit down in the legal node, which is full of lawyers, which come up with solutions of how to use the current legislation to be able to accept Bitcoin for their businesses. So what have we done? We have a website. You can look at CryptoBayMontevideo.com. Unfortunately, right now it's only in Spanish because it's 14 days old. Uh, we've done strategic alliance with Blockchain Spain, Blockchain Iberoamerica, and La Diconf. And next week, we are launching our podcast of Crypto Bay Montevideo. We also went to the Parliament of Uruguay and started talking to the, par to the legislators and the senators of how to apply this for each one of the areas. We didn't go to the technology area. We got together the people who were in agriculture, the people who were in health, the people who were in different areas, responsible for those areas, and started explaining of possible solutions that could be implemented in the Uruguayan government. And these are companies that we, and companies and associations that support us. Finished. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, that, that, that was really quick. <laughs> You're right. Ah, okay now. Thank you very much, Pablo, for your speech. Muchas gracias por tu habla. And we have a little bit time for one question. So if anybody have a question here, you are lucky today. Thank you. I wanted to ask, how do you see the European Union in terms of uh, regulation? Are we too slow or will we able to catch up someday? Well, I mean, all of these jurisdictions are part of the European Union. So, except Switzerland, uh, Liechtenstein is part of the European Economic Area, okay, Malta, and Gibraltar. So, basically, what's happening is what will the European Union take as an example of all of these different approaches towards le legislation? Will they take the Malta approach? Will they take the Liechtenstein approach of a token economy? Or will they take the principles approach of, uh, of Gibraltar? So basically, that's, I think the European Union has advanced. Uh, France has just uh, said that it was going to do something in terms of ICOs. So I think that Europe is the, the, the area, the economic area, that is most forward-thinking in terms of this new ecosystem. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'm sorry we don't have any more time for questions, but I hope you will stay uh, some time oh, here I, on the I'm Congress. here, no problem. Okay, so anyway. thanks once again, Pablo. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. And if you would like to stay here in Studio One, we will have a panel discussion that will moderate Pavel Luptak, and it will be about anonymous cryptocurrencies. So if you are interested in this topic, you can stay here or go to another speech that is led by Pavel 